A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. Today, I am speaking with John Richardson, who is a senior consultant at ICIS. John's been on the show a number of times um, in class, including most recently episode 36. You can go listen to that. Um, And as he shares his views on what's going on um, across the chemicals industry, um, polymers in particular, and with a a close view to China and the impacts that the market has. So anyway, John, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thank you, Victoria. Glad to have you back on your uh, your uh, episodes. I got to tell you, are always popular. I kind of keep track of which l- episodes are people listening to, and they're listening to yours, Sean. So that's a good sign. We've got a lot of relatives. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you <and me> both. <laughs> and a lot of friends in the audience that are happy to hear your insights. So we're recording this here at the end of 2022. And I think at the, you know, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the year, there was this whole expectation that the world and China was going to be coming out of the doldrums, if you will, that were caused by COVID, supply chain disruptions, et cetera. Um, And I don't think we've really seen this. So how is the year manifested when you, from where you're sitting, when you're looking at um, polymers markets and the European and Asian markets? Well, Victoria, I think, you would have expected some kind of moderation of growth in China anyway, because what people I think didn't fully realize was the extent to which China benefited from the pandemic boom. It was all the um, China in China out story we talked about before. So all the chemicals and polymers going to China re-exported as durable goods we were buying in lockdown in the rich world. So you always expected a moderation of growth, but you'd expect growth still to be very positive. And of course, a much bigger base of tons. So people were saying China's going to get stronger. I didn't really get that because how could it get stronger relative to what was already a fantastic 2021, 2020, right? That didn't make sense. Um, And of course, what we, none of us foresaw was zero COVID um, from March onwards. And that's, you already had the structural uh, slowdown in the Chinese economy. We can talk about the later called common prosperity, which you that meant that China's growth was going to be lower over the longer term, right? We had the deleveraging of the real estate sector, which is worth 29% of GDP. And you can look at our data at ICIS and you see that a lot of chemical demand growth since 2009 has been driven by that real estate sector, the tremendous demand yeah. growth, leading China to have a bigger share globally than they had before, much bigger. So we mm-hmm. knew that trend was, was, was working through as they pushed for more income equality, better capital allocation away from speculative property. So that was going to moderate growth as well over time. But bang, zero COVID. You know, the the government is now, well, through the year, I thought, hold on, they cannot relax zero COVID because the effectiveness of Chinese vaccines wanes over time. So if you have three... So 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 let's talk really quickly what zero COVID is. So zero COVID was this policy that China had of uh, no COVID, tra- I mean, no COVID transmissions. I mean, my, all right. So from the outside looking in, all it meant to me was really just even more and more shutdowns whenever there was a case. So what was zero, yeah. what did zero COVID mean to China? It meant we're going to have zero cases. We're going to aim to eradicate the disease, not live with it. So Anthony Fauci is just resigning. Isn't he? He, sorry, he's retiring. And he said today in the FT, it makes no, sense whatsoever because you can't eradicate the virus right yeah this is not a this is not a disease like let's just say polio where there was a a global process to eradicate polio which is mostly or cholera or something else yeah covid is a very different um uh 
disease or virus, I guess. Well, it's not serious to start with. I mean, yes, yeah. it's killed a lot of people. Uh, you know, I'm yeah. not under underestimating how terrible it is, but compared with cholera or polio, um, and it can't be eradicated. You have to live with it. But China said we're going to eradicate it, and the problem is, it's twofold. First, the Chinese vaccines, the Sinovac, the, the the effectiveness wanes over time, whereas the the mRNA vaccines, the overseas vaccines, it lasts longer. They've got very low vaccination rates among the over 60s and the over 80s, right? Because they're right. stuck at home, can't get to vaccine centers for whatever reasons. The very low vaccination rates, and of course, they're the most vulnerable, and they will not import foreign vaccines. Right? That's the problem. And the healthcare system, if they suddenly said tomorrow, right, we're going to get rid of zero COVID tomorrow. I mean, everyone's getting excited about this a few weeks ago. They're relaxing the quarantine regulations, weren't they? Markets went crazy. Um, I think it's Fudan University est estimated there were 1.5 million deaths from an exit wave. And the hospitals wow. are, not, are not equipped to cope with the number of serious cases in the context of the waning effectiveness of vaccines. So that, that was clear really from April this year see that from just reading the medical journals and so when people said zero co is going to come to an end there'll be a massive boom in chemicals demand there's no doubt that will happen right? when they get past zero covid it'll go great the chemical markets will boom as people come out and spend lots of money right. but, you know zero covid means you're locked down in your condo you the restaurants are shut the shops are shut um you're sometimes almost frightened to go out in case you get picked up and take to a government quarantine center. Because I've got sure. good friends in Shanghai, it's like that. I don't know, should I go out? For a while, there's a real problem delivering stuff to people's condos because the delivery drivers didn't want to go to a different suburb because the, the zero COVID rules vary by different districts. So uh, you think you're finding your own okay. district, move to another district, and you end up uh, taken off to a government quarantine centre because the rules are yeah. quite arbitrary because the local officials are trying to please Beijing by being extra zealous. And it's almost like we don't worry about the economic damage, but the issue is how did he get past this? Well, first of all, the need to get do something about vaccinations, right? Which is a yes, big issue. yeah. Secondly, they need to prepare for that exit, exit way by investing a fortune in hospitals. And as I said, throughout the year, I was, I was saying, well, no, they're not going to get, not going to end zero COVID anytime soon. People say, yes, they're going to end it. No, 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 no. And no. we've seen with the, the, the data on the chemicals markets, now look at polyolefins, as you know, progressively through the year, we've seen with the net import numbers and our estimates of local production that we're moving to negative growth or flat growth across the polyolefins. Um, LDP being the worst, but that's to do with other reasons to do with its relative expense. It's very expensive LDP versus linear low. Right. But linear low minus 2%, polypropylene might just get to 1% this year growth, possibly or flat. HGP minus 2% thing, and then LDP minus 6%, which is third year of decline, it would be. That's what the latest data is suggesting. At the start of the year, people said, oh, we're looking at 6 to 7% growth across linear H and PP, maybe low is going to be weak. People accepted that. So this is a massive right. change from expectations. And we're getting almost end of the year now with the data. So how much is that, um, when you think about the growth or the, the negative growth, the losses, I guess, uh, retraction, um, is about export versus domestic demand in China, right? And I know that's kind of hard to measure because a lot of stuff's getting produced into goods and then getting shipped. So, you know, where is, is this really a function, not just of moderation globally, but really just the whole zero COVID in China and um, shutting down the domestic economy? I think it started with the domestic economy. Um, I think it's that loss of con consumer confidence. And I must mention the property bill as well, which uh, yeah. the government put option was that we will never let land prices and property prices fall. So that was in place for 20 years. So people yeah. would invest in property, second or third, fourth properties, some very rich people. 
and they would buy land even though the property hadn't been built on the assumption the developer would be fine financially because the government would always rescue the property developers and that's gone because land prices and home prices are falling so that's a big factor as well I should mention that that's a loss of domestic as i said you can really link that booming stimulus since 2009 into chemicals demand and most of that stimulus went into real estate so you saw China retake off in terms of global share of consumption of chemicals and polymers. So it's domestic, people not willing to spend money, shut at home. For a while, I think at least they couldn't get the deliveries of the stuff online, and that's a lot of packaging, a lot of right. internet packaging. Um, I think more lately, we still we still saw reasonable export growth, I think certainly in, in, in pricing, because of course prices went up. But we're now seeing, I think, significant volume falls of Chinese exports which is 20% of GDP. That's more recently, I think, last few months, couple of months. Um, two things there. Logistics problems still around the, the Guangdong province, enormous export processing province, Guangdong, for example. They've got some lockdowns there again. Um, yeah. And, of course, you've got the inflation in the West, which is now affecting an, an inevitable cycle out of durable goods demand post-pandemic as people have bought the washing machines. You know, you buy a washing machine once every few years, you probably brought that purchase purchase forward didn't you when you had government stimulus yeah so so that's affecting that 20 percent of the so it's, it's getting worse because of that domestic that the export slowdown last couple of months i think got it interesting so what's the if i mean so when we think about just what has happened was there you know what other surprises were there if we if we look at where the year started and where the year is ending are there any other surprises that have have changed polyethylene, polypropylene in Europe and Asia. And then I guess the I think, effect is globally, right? Because it's yeah, a global market effectively. Yeah. I think the biggest surprise for me was that I thought China was doing a really good job on the pandemic. And it's not. Yeah. And that surprised me. And, and that really from March onwards, April, you start to say, just read the medical journals and you will see that work, they, weren't, they have not been a good, doing a good job on the, on the vaccine because, yeah. on the pandemic, sorry, because of the weakness of Chinese vaccines and the politics of importing foreign vaccines. To me, that was a big surprise. Um, a second big surprise is the extent to which the China has cut operating rates. <laughs> and normally we haven't seen that because China runs hard to keep people in jobs in the washing machine factory downstream. It's not about profitability. You can see that from the spreads versus the operating rates over time. The data tell us mm. that. But it suddenly dawned on me, well, it's not about profitability, it's about demand. There is simply isn't enough demand. So they have to cut. If you can't sell it, you can't, you know, yeah. you can't produce it, can you? Yeah. So it's not about profits, which are off the charts weak. I mean, right. polypropylene margins were $185 a ton negative last week for injection grade in Northeast Asia. It's the, simply the fact there's no demand. And what's further surprising to me is despite the big cuts in particularly polypropylene production, the market is still weak. So that tells you the extent to which demand has been affected in China. Yeah. John, how much of this is affected by the Russia-Ukraine conflict? that has been ongoing for most of the year. Well, I think then you can sort of turn turn the attention, therefore, to Europe more on that, because inflation yeah. is not only in China as much, and they're getting cheap euros, crude, and stuff like that. It's helping them, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, looking at Europe, um, that's big because of the demand destruction downstream in polyolefins. Even probably in average shopping basket sizes and you know people are cutting back on the basics because of the cost of heating in, in the UK is, is off the charts higher than it was you know a year ago and across Europe right so people are, can take the choice of cutting back on you know essential food shopping and paying the heating bills yeah and of course that's that's affecting pot I mean poly, poly office demand again and, and you know the durable goods applications into say autos is really struggling in mm. um, how much, so, hey John, how much of this yeah. is a function of production cuts because of lack of availability of feedstocks or energy 
you know, in the form of electricity okay. and fuel to power, yeah. fuel boilers and what have you, and how much of this is, um, is demand destruction or is it hard to separate? I think, I mean, at the moment the, the gas storage levels in Europe are good. It's been a very mild early winter. As you know, the yeah. gas price has more than half, doesn't it, since its peak. So at the moment, there's not that much pressure on producers in terms of gas costs and supply as there was a few months ago. Okay. So it's not a production. I mean, we, all, we all thought there was a scenario where this winter we'd see major production cutbacks, even whole complexes, very integrated complexes closing down. And you know, you reach a certain operating rate, you've got to close, haven't you? Yeah. And, and particularly in Germany, where over the years of the move from fuel oil uh, to gas to, to fire the furnaces to get the 850 degrees centigrade or whatever it is, you know, very high temperatures. So it's very dependent. Germany is very dependent on Russian gas, not just from the grid, but for the furnaces. Um, but that hasn't transpired. So I think the issue more is demand. And in terms of, yes, the, the margins have come down. You look at our average variable cost margins for the polyethylenes and polypropylene in Europe, Unlike Asia, they're still making money, yeah. but they're much lower than they were. Yeah. And, yeah. of course, they're, they're, they're in, they've got energy surcharges as well. So they're introducing those surcharges to customers, which may or may not be included in our base price. It's complicated. Got it. so that's, yeah, yeah, that's a hard one sometimes to, to factor. It is. I think it's more of demand destruction at the moment, Victoria, but you talk to our gas team, um. And they're saying that we're not out of the woods yet with this winter. It could get a lot colder. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still early, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a lot. Story Several early more months to go. Yeah. Yeah, it could get a lot colder. And um, Russia may reduce gas flows through Ukraine. They're, they're threatening to do that. Um, and there may be a problem uh, in the build up to next winter, depending yeah. on how much demand is reduced. Um, and the, the just lack of LNG supply and regasification terminals and distribution of, I mean, like Spain's got lots of regasification terminals, but no pipelines to link to Northern Europe. So, right. so the gas team say, watch for next winter. So I think there's a European production problem for chemicals potentially next winter and possibly later this winter. But at the moment, I see more. So you think there might be a one year delay or one year lag in some of these production issues? I think that's we've got to watch that. And of course, the other thing for Europe is supply that, you know, obviously people are driving. So the refinery feed stocks are coming back, they're flying. So you're getting more, more availability of naphtha as they run, you know, for kerosene and diesel and gasoline. And the US production, well, it had to be better than last year <laughs> because last year was, you know, your Texas winter storm, your hurricanes, and so they still have those logistics issues that are restricting U.S. exports, which you know very well, the trucks and the rail cars and yeah. the warehousing. And everything. Yeah. But you look at the, the data for polyethylene exports, and it's significantly up this year, and you've got new startups, haven't you? So that's kind of easing the supply side of Europe as demand, you know, destruction hits at the downstream mm. level. Um, sure. I think one of the things I've been talking a lot about is the, the incredibly high premiums for Europe and the rest of the world over China. Hey gang, this is Victoria. I just wanted to let you know about a community that we've built specifically for the chemical industry and listeners of The Chemical Show. It's called The Chemical Community. A pretty direct name, right? The Chemical Community is a web-based community accessed right from your desktop or smartphone, built specifically to increase engagement between you and your peers in the chemical industry. One of the reasons I built The Chemical Show and now The Chemical Community is to create greater connection across members of the industry, to share stories, gain insights, to know more and to do more for each other and for our industry. When you join the chemical community, you become part of something bigger. Members of the chemical community share insights about trends and topics in the chemical industry, get early access to podcast guests, participate in special events exclusive to the community, 
get event replays, and much more. I go live in the community twice a month to engage members and facilitate dialogue across the group. This community is growing and evolving based on what you want and need. As one of our members, Dennis, has said, learning what's top of mind for other companies and industries generates the opportunity for new insights that I can apply to my own business. Thanks, Dennis. And as we all know, insights drive innovation, drive value. So want to be part of the chemical community? Just head on over to thechemicalcommunity.com. The link is also in the show notes. Head on over there to sign up and start building a closer connection with your peers in the chemical industry. Thanks. And I'll see you there. Yeah. So talk more about that. What are you seeing as premiums? I mean, I think everybody's seeing some premiums and maybe some kind of just more regional market activity as opposed to global driving. But what do you see as, as some of these dis- differentials or just what's well, driving all, what, 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 Yeah, it was a container freight rate being so high and lack of container space. So that meant that oversupply was essentially trapped in, in, in Northeast Asia. As China was slowing down through 2022, and in fact, from April 2020, April 2021 onwards, China was decelerating versus the peak pandemic demand. As supply increased, and that oversupply was trapped, in, in essence, in, in Northeast Asia, because the big exporters couldn't move that supply to other regions because of the cost and availability of container freight. Yeah. And I think Europe was kept tight by, the Western Hemisphere was kept tight by the, the winter storm, etc., and all the pandemic stimulus that was flowing through economies still then. So, I mean, I'm looking at high density polyethylene injection grade. The average Northwest European November 2002 to December 2020 premium was $280 a ton. Between 1 January 2021 and the 25th of November last week, $683 a ton. So that's wow, huge. Wow, so it's increase. almost tripled or it's gone up 250%. The pricing premium. Yeah. And the question I keep asking is, will premiums come down to historic long-term levels? And what would that mean for you? It's a magic question, John. I I think everybody wants to know that question. Yeah. And then you look at India, you look at Pakistan, you look at Vietnam, you look at um, Peru, (laughs) Mexico, Brazil, all see the same dynamics, essentially. Mm. I think the U.S. is a different market. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, what's... What about the Middle East, right? I mean, for years, Middle East was the low cost production center. They were the exporters to the world. And yet I don't kind of nobody talks about it anymore. What do you see happening Um, there? Are they still just chugging along uh, (laughs) quietly or or what's changed, if anything? You know, if you look at Saudi, it's the most important, biggest producer right. in the Middle East. I'm just looking at polypropylene. They're very diversified in that mm. they're not that dependent on China. You said they've got amazing production costs, haven't they, as you say, but only 6% of their production of polypropylene is dependent on exports to China. Only 6% of their total exports go to China, right? Um, I haven't got the data for Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Um, and all QA, but it's really that Saudi position on polypropylene, similar on polyethylene. Um, so they're more diversified, they're sent to more regions. So that's that's good. Um, but you know, the problem for them still is the loss of that China market. With polypropylene, China probably becoming a net exporter next year, which is extraordinary because in 2021, it was 42% of total net imports globally going to net exports in 2023. It would be stunning, wouldn't it? Stunning turnaround. So they would still need to place those other volumes, missing volumes to China in the other big net import markets like Turkey, Europe, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. So, yeah. But they're still in a better position. Um, than, And it's because of the links with Europe. right? But I think the okay. challenge there for the Middle East is if those European premiums come down and China stays where it is, and there's two scenarios for next year, I think, and Middle East have got to think about this, right? Scenario one is to get past zero COVID. 
And then if European premiums come down over China, so what? Because China's coming up. <laughs> you know, yes. China's rising, yeah. massive boom in demand, chemical prices will go really strongly up. No question about it across the board. Yeah. If they don't get past zero COVID, you've got oversupply continuing then those premiums will start coming down. And what does that do to, to Middle East profitability, even with the gas advantage? Because they'll be making so much more money in Europe versus China because of those premiums, right? right. And in Latin American markets and in Turkey, et cetera. That's the challenge, I think, for all producers, but even for the, the feedstock advantaged. So that's scenario one. Yeah, What's your scenario two? I think scenario two is zero cover comes to an end, as I said, and okay. whoosh, we're, off to, we're off to the races again. But I still think that you've got to think about common prosperity and the, the, the structural long-term slowdown in China and its rising self-sufficiency it will remain long-term challenges for us. But we'd certainly see a big bounce if they get past it. So, John, I, I think <laughs> this whole topic of a, a structural long-term uh, slowdowns may be a strong word, but less demand or flattening of demand. You know, so if we think about some of the drivers going on globally, sustainability, a drive towards circularity, um, a lot of pressure on um, producers, especially those that are tied to the stock market, which is, you know, let's just say the US and European folks and uh, maybe China less so, um, although they have some different drivers. Some people would say we should be flattening polymer demand, polyethylene, polypropylene, and yet we still see growth, right? So Shell just started up its big uh, polyethylene plant um, in the U.S. And of course, that decision was made years ago. It takes a while to get there. Chevron and Qatar just announced a big investment. Right. So there's a lot of investments going on. Um, where's all the polymer going? If Is, is there really a long-term slowdown? Um, is the demand shifting in regions? Very where, good where's question. The, where's the product going? Good question. I mean, um, just looking at, I'm just going to look at the, our data quickly because this is quite extraordinary and I thought, is this right? But you know, double check it, and it's right based on our supply and demand database. Let's look at high density polyethylene, right? Between 2000 and 2021, annual capacity in excess of global demand was 4 million tons a year. Between mm -hmm. 2022 and 2025, it rises to 11 million tons a year, right? Polypropylene. 2000 2021, 7 million tons a year, 20 million tons a year between 2022 and 2025. Wow, so that's for what, polypropylene? Yeah, polypropylene, wow. is, we, we talked before the podcast about being the problem child for all other reasons. So th these are in enormous numbers and changes. So I, I think the low carbon thing is really important because the Chevron project with Qatar has highlighted low carbon. The, the INEOS project at Antwerp is talking about low carbon based on ethane feedstock and the, the ability to, to go to green hydrogen when that, if that works out at that same site and some recycling some substantial recycling as well so i think yeah. sustainability around there's also the canadian project that dow's planning as well that talks about low carbon with e crackers nuclear fern you know nuclear reactors to, to power the furnaces and carbon capture and storage and eventually hopefully green hydrogen if that works all these things plus separate challenges is, is recycling plastic rubbish isn't it yeah maybe we're talking about a world in which there will be growth it will be lower it'll be more regional because europe will still need to import a lot of polymers right? if you look at our data out the 2040 huge amount of linear low h and pp low europe is an s exporter so where's it going to come from well, if, if Europe carries on its current course, I don't see any reason why it won't. They might have a carbon border adjustment mechanism. You've got the brand owners committed to reducing carbon as well as dealing with plastic waste. Right. Um, the producers respond, so the Europe becomes a market which you know sets a higher price on carbon or a mm. higher value to reducing carbon. And so that still will be a, a market that will grow okay, won't it? 
long term. You'll still need lots of polymers, right? Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah. Is that the play? Uh, or will we see well, less efficient capacity shut down? Yeah. Do you track that? Does does ICIS track that? Do you track the as kind of almost a different price set, low carbon polymers or the sources, right? So I would imagine, and maybe there's not enough volume at this point in time to to do anything with that. But is that part of your future plans to be able to track, let's just say traditional HDPE and then a low carbon? HDPE that's produced via circularity yeah. or incorporates other uh, carbon capture, other technologies that make it more sustainable, if you will? We started to, yeah. Uh, we've got a joint venture with a German company called Carbon, Carbon Mines, right? Okay. And we've got our supply and demand database, which has got all the plants and projects in the world. And the Carbon Mines team have the, the the expertise to look at the different technology different technologies different process technologies and we've got sort of third party data upstream to oil and gas extraction but we look at primarily the polymer plant and we compare different processes different technologies in different regions mm. and in different energy sources so you know for example in china we know that polypropylene is 11 times worse for carbon if it's coal versus pdh Although China sure. itself is at a disadvantage globally because it uses most of its energy via coal, right? Full stop. Right. For energy. And we know that the US is in a very advantaged position relative to other regions because of the gas-based production, same as the Middle East. So we have the data on every polymer plant in the world, which you know is going to be really important information for your converters and processors in Europe and for your brand owners. Um, this is this is third party secondary data. So it's scope three emissions. If you're looking at it from the perspective of the downstream companies, right? So that's scope three for them, isn't it? Their suppliers. Right. Um, a lot of people will say, well, I have our, we have our primary data. And they'll say, we know better about our carbon emissions than anybody else. So a big, you know, polymer producer will know better. But right. I, I personally feel that there will be an alignment between primary and secondary data where mm -hmm. Individual companies will have their own standards, which is fine, but we need to standardize enough to compare across companies to give it that extra stamp of credibility. I'm not saying it's not credible already. Companies doing a great job, but I think we can make it better and stronger by having international comparisons of carbon. And then you can really start thinking, you know, are we moving in the right direction globally? So I think yes. this is a first step for ISIS um, and it will evolve. But it's, 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 it's a good, very, very good start, I think. And I think this will become critical. You start looking at... Um, is, is that information yeah, yet publicly available or available to your customers? Or is yes, it still in development? Joint, it is available. Okay. We have a joint venture with um, Carbon Mines. Um, and yes, we can you can subscribe to it through ICIS. Right. Um, so happy to present to any customers who are interested. I'll get the experts from Journey to present, not me. I'm not an expert on this at all, but they can present how it works. Um, yeah. Um, but I don't know, Victoria. I do think this might may be the logic behind these new projects. And I mean, in, in Saudi, that they've committed that the next cracker, all future crackers will be low carbon in Saudi. And you've got the BSF SABIC joint venture on e-crackers as well. And yeah. certainly all, any investment in Europe will have to be low carbon. And I think they might be retrofitting old capacity to make it low carbon as well. So is, is that the future in a more self-sufficient China and a lower growth world? Mm. So it's interesting to mm -hmm. speak to the, the C-suites and see what they think. But you, you would think on the surface, logically, why would you announce these big new projects? But I think that's the driver. And the developing world, sorry, finally, are <laughs> you sorry? Yeah, developing no, I, I don't know what the drive, you know, I, I, I'm with you on it, John, but I think some of this, the economics don't match up. Um, and some of the yeah. announcements are indications as opposed to certainties, right? So right, there's okay. a lot, um, indications. There, there's hope. And there's a lot of hope out there, but you know, even I've seen, you know, you read different things or, or hear from different experts and something like 50% of the technologies that we need to accomplish some of these, um, 
sustainability targets and carbon targets, et cetera, haven't even been discovered, right? So there's steps in the right direction, but it's not solutions. It's not holistic solutions. Yeah, and um, I know that Dow and um, I think Axon have talked about the need for a stable uh, a stable prior carbon pricing regime or a clear carbon pricing regime, sorry, in, in the US to have carbon capture hub in Houston. So it's a technology issue, isn't it, as well, Victoria, but the, the actual regulatory issue is that, I think. Yeah, um, well, and I would imagine at some point um, when there is disparity in um, the approaches in terms of how products are actually produced, what's produced under low carbon and what's not, um, that'll further regionalize the markets. Yeah, and I think CBAM will be, you know, a barrier that exporters have to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, standard they have to overcome, and, and if that does happen, it's not certainly what happened to chemicals, but possibly by 2026. Yeah. You certainly, and the, the big thing again, as always, is China. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talking about carbon in a big way. And if China were to go for it, and it would fit with the need to escape the middle income trap with the manufacturing value chain and come on prosperity is about cleaning up the environment, international commitments to carbon. If they went for it in a big way and started making their chemicals industry low carbon while also pushing in our modern recycling industry, which they're already doing to some extent. Imagine the effects globally if that happened. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I do think, John, though, and this is, um, this is, you know, maybe we even need to push this into another, uh, another podcast episode because we're going to run long, as we always do, and that's fine. But I, you know, I think there's this view that actually China is going to be retiring more people and more workers than they're bringing into the system, right? That the the one child uh, regime um, as it's managing and controlling population that China population is actually gonna decline. So when I think about some of the low carbon technologies and where they fit, not necessarily in polymers, but if you think about more broadly across the chemical industry, a lot of it is actually far less efficient. So how China, is able to bring on the low carbon technologies that maybe are less efficient at a time when um, the workforce is diminishing as well, you know, what does it do? Is it going to happen or is there, you know, maybe that drives innovation and a different solution? Yeah, it's a really good point. I know it's, a se- it's a separate subject, but then you get onto how global regulations develop. If we end up with a, a global price on carbon, it moves the cost curve sufficiently, then it would work for China, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's true. That's that, and you know what? You're right. That's that's what changes the game is the uh, the carbon price and the shift. And they could, they could make it domestically. They could do a lot to do that. And if they were then demanding low carbon imports, and they still have to import a lot of polyethylene. I mean, I talk about self sufficiency, mm-hmm. but for the polyethylenes, they'll still be a big importer for the next twenty years. Right. We think. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I suppose. Uh, Big growth in recycling we might reduce those imports absolutely, but it might be we'd only take it from low carbon sources. That would that would reinforce that, wouldn't it? The local yeah. producers would then match their own CBAT, wouldn't they? In terms of price premiums, maybe. Yeah. You know, lots so of changes in the future. Yeah. So yeah. that's the, so I'd love to speak to the CEOs of Chevron and Dow. Maybe they'll talk to us on the next podcast. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we go, John. That would be good. Get some some insights. So, so let, let's bring it back closer to home. We um, are about to enter 2023. What's your prediction? What should we be looking for um, over the next year? A razor-like focus on the government messaging about zero COVID. Any reports you can get your hands on on the extent to which they, they've breached the gap in terms of healthcare provision in terms of sufficient vaccinations for the over 60s and over 80s. Um, because be careful what you wish for. If they suddenly said zero COVID is over, you get this big exit way. So you can't see that being a benefit, can you? You go backwards, yeah. you go forwards and backwards, wouldn't you, very quickly? Yeah. So that's the key. Because then the savings rates are very high in China. People are not spending money. 
you think those the ability the willingness to spend money when zero COVID ends will be will be tempered by the at the end of the property pool, true, but people will still come out and spend money. Hmm. And this is very difficult, but we've got to yeah. talk about it. Political unrest in China, social unrest, as we've seen the last few days. Hmm. We need to watch that very closely. Yeah, because now absolutely. there's been some really serious issues in Shanghai. But I'd say in terms of chemical prices, watch zero COVID. Um, in terms of Europe, watch demand destruction versus the support that will be offered to pricing, if that's the right term, <laughs> by energy-related production cutbacks. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't do much for the profitability of producers, but it would certainly support the markets, wouldn't it, in a, yeah. in a I suppose, negative way. Um, yeah. And I suppose the other thing to watch out is how the US is able to export your logistics issues, because you've got a lot more polymers and you're moving to a, a stronger net export position on polypropylene because there's new projects coming on stream next few years so you right. think you're already a net exporter aren't you but it's increasing isn't it over the next couple of years yeah. so that's something else to yeah. watch and how that affects the global market um, yeah and, and where do we see inflation in all of this good news i think i was reading again in the financial times this morning that it looks like well container freight rates now the FT say are back towards pre-pandemic levels, which is means five times higher, according to their estimate. And um, maybe not on all routes, but average. Um, I think you know high oil prices are a cure for high oil prices, aren't they? So we've got demand destruction. Yes, they are. Always, always the case. I think there's, there's always a danger of more geopolitically driven energy disruptions, which could add to the energy costs, and they're still very mm -hmm. high, but we seem to be past peak inflation, I'm hoping. So that's a positive thing, maybe towards the middle of next year, end of next year, we see that inflation pressure coming off in the West, and that will support some recovery in demand. Um, but going back to polymers, Victoria, we just have a huge amount of overcapacity. And yeah. You know, that 2025 20, period, you would say 2022 to 2025 period I was talking about, we have 20 million tons a year of overcapacity in polypropylene, which is, you know, a record high. You'd think that most of the steel is in the ground, wouldn't you, for that period? If you're. Yes. Um, yeah, I would assume of, that most of that is, is on its way being built. But so it has to happen. We have out to 2022, 2030, we have, you know, 80 million tons of surplus capacity, but you would think a lot of that could get postponed. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's always the opportunity for rationalization, for, for assets yeah. shutting down. Yeah. Um, it, you know, kind of depends on where they are and where, where they are in terms of location and how they fit on the cost curve, right? Because that's the, the other solution to overcapacity is just getting yeah. rid of capacity. I think so. Um, and we've been talking about, you know, some of the sort of, I suppose, Northeast Asian assets, you know, ex-China being under pressure for many years. Yeah. So we may see some rationalization there. Um, not sure about Europe. It's interesting whether some of the older crackers there might be under pressure. Maybe. I mean, they've rationalized a lot of them already. So I don't know what's left sure. to rationalize. Maybe not much. Um but something has to give. Yeah. So these are extraordinary numbers. Uh, maybe de bottleneckings. We need to go through our project database, I think, and see what is new, what's really happening, what's a de bottlenecking that could be delayed, and then maybe some net numbers mm. versus, you know, some scenarios where we could reduce that oversupply, I think. As you say, yeah. also rationalization. Well, and I would imagine, depending on how some of these um, advanced recycling projects develop, you know, a capacity is not always capacity, John, right? So some capacity um, actually operates much slower, depending on what's being produced. So, you know, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me how some of that's playing out and if that will have an effect as well on net capacity. Yeah, because we, we, we pro rotate over a few years and, you know, I think looking at the U.S. projects and you've got 
120 the year, 320 next year, up to a million tons, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And that might be staggered more conservatively, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It's easy to announce. It's easy to announce it's harder to build. Yeah. And then harder to operate under these conditions. Harder to build as well is an issue. We may have issues around building as well as operating, that, you know, technical issues around building and starting up on schedule. Yeah. Um, I mean, the big issue is China's, uh, which one is it? I think it's polypropylene. Now, one of the polymers, I'm not going to say which one it is, is another 16% capacity increase next year. That's <laughs> which one it is, I can't recall. So they're going to have to think very hard now, aren't they? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's all well and good. You know, we want to be a bit exporter of, say, polypropylene, but where are they going to sell it? And at what netbacks? Especially you if the netbacks, are, yeah, and the netbacks are falling. You know, the China's polypropylene exports have been going up, and then they've started coming down since April because the netbacks are coming down because China pricing is dragging the rest of the world close to its level. You see, so that will have an effect next year, and they'll, they'll maybe moderating their. Op- I mean, anyway, our base case operating rates for China polymers. Are the lowest we've seen since 2000, our estimates for next year. So, like 79%, 77%, 78%, very mm. low operating rates. Yeah. Which reflects, I think, the economics. So, something has to give, doesn't it? When we get back into yeah. balance. <laughs> maybe, and maybe that's the maybe that's the theme for 2023. Something has to give. Yeah. Good. Well, time yeah. will tell. Well, John, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate having you on the Chemical Show, sharing your insights once again. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks everyone for listening. We will talk to you again next time. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.